great to have the uh, violin this morning for the first time. Why don't we just acknowledge uh, Gian? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, like you, I've been enjoying the hot weather over the past uh, few weeks. And the flat which we live in is right at the top of the block. And it has a flat roof. And when we get the sun on the roof in the hot weather, the flat becomes uh, really uh, humid and uh, hot. And we leave all of the windows open to try and get some air into the place. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, out in Oxford Street in the early evening. I think it was on the Friday. And um, I looked up, and the sky was beginning to turn black. So I rang my son, who was at home, and I said, John, can you go around the flat, and can you please shut all of the windows, because it looks like it's going to rain. And lo and behold, about half an hour later, there was a huge downpour, and a good thing that we had been able to shut the windows because otherwise everything would have been drenched. Well, there are seasons in nature, but in the Old Testament, in the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon talks about the changing seasons of life. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to cry. And uh, in the natural, let me use this one. Thank you, Wilson. Ah, it's better. In the natural, the weather can change very suddenly, uh, even within particular uh, seasons, as it did a couple of weeks ago. And within our own lives as well, suddenly things can change. It will certainly not always be sunny, and storms can come. And today we're continuing our mini-series on the storms of life with a particular focus today on finances. So the title of today's message is Finances, Weathering the Storm. But first let's pray as we come around God's Word. Father, we thank you that your Word brings life. And we pray this morning... Lord, that your word would find good soil in our hearts, that you would water it, and it would spring up to eternal life. So, Lord, would you give us ears to hear this morning what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I have three questions for you. And the first question is this. Are you ready for the storm? Are you ready for the storm? Now, how many people know that when we accept Christ, it's not all plain sailing? In fact, Jesus promises the opposite. In John 16, 33, he says, in this world you will have trouble. He doesn't say you might have trouble. He doesn't say you may have trouble. He says you will have trouble. But the verse doesn't end there. It goes on, Jesus goes on to say, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And there are many examples in scripture of people of faith who face testing times. Job is an example. Job is a righteous man, but God allows Job to be tested. And several disasters fall upon Job and his household. The house where his sons and daughters are feasting is destroyed by a literal storm, a mighty wind, and they're killed. But throughout all of this adversity, Job remains firm in his faith and firm in his belief that God is good and faithful. Job 5, verse 7. Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks, that is the flames from a, a fire, fly upward. And there's probably not a day goes by when you don't encounter some kind of argument, some kind of hassle, something you have to deal with. And I mean, even when you go on holiday, there can be uh, problems maybe with the transport, 
There can be uh, problems with your flight, with your accommodation. Maybe you get to the hotel and the food is not very good. But a storm is something that goes beyond the ordinary, everyday hassles of life. A storm is something which is much more serious. A storm is something which threatens to sink you. Perhaps there's a serious illness, either yourself or maybe a family member or a friend. Maybe somebody in your family or a friend dies unexpectedly. Maybe there are difficulties in your relationship with your children or your parents, or there are difficulties in your marriage. Situations where you find yourself crying out to God, God, how can you let this happen? God, do you really love me? God, are you even real? And it's important to be aware that storms can come at any time and to always be prepared for them. Jesus says that at the time of Noah, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying and being given in marriage. And they knew nothing of the impending flood. And it came and swept them away. And as a believer, you should always be ready. You should always be alert. Yes, with regard to the second coming. Jesus can come at any time, and that's what he was talking about. But also with regard to the trials and the temptations and the tests of life. And anything else that may come along. You need to be ready. You need to be prepared. So, you should not be surprised when situations come which seriously test your faith. Situations which threaten to sink your faith. So my question, are you ready for the storm? Because the storms will come. Here's my second question. Are you building wisely? And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about wise and foolish builders. I have the verses up on the screen, so why don't we uh, read this together? Let's uh, read it strongly. Let's read it out. It's God's Word. It's good to read God's Word together, to celebrate God's Word, to declare it in the congregation of the people. So uh, here we go. Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It's interesting to contrast these words of Jesus with some words here from former Chancellor Gordon Brown. In 1997, he said this, Stability is necessary for our future economic success. The British economy of the future must not be built on the shifting sands of boom and bust, but on the bedrock of prudent and wise economic management for the long term. It's only these firm foundations that we can raise Britain's underlying economic performance. And uh, Gordon Brown, who was former chancellor and then later uh, prime minister for a short time, was brought up within a Christian family. He was a a Scottish Presbyterian. And it's pretty clear, actually, that he's alluding to the words of the parable in what he says here about foundations and rock and sand. But, of course, 10 years later, in uh, 2007-8, just like the house in the story of Jesus the British economy did indeed fall with a great crash. And those of you who remember the history may recall that it started with a bank called Northern Rock, which found itself with a lot of bad mortgages on its books. 
And then there was a bank run. There were pictures in the media of queues of people queuing around the corner to try and withdraw their money from the bank because they were worried about the bank's stability. And the government had to step in. It had to step in and rescue Northern Rock. It stepped in as well to rescue RBS and Lloyds and effectively nationalized uh, those banks. And despite Gordon Brown's good intentions, several large financial institutions had not been prudently and financially uh, wisely managed. With hindsight, there was a consensus that there had been an inadequate amount of regulation and oversight not just here, but also uh, abroad and elsewhere. And despite the name of this bank, when the bad times came, Northern Rock, along with the others, was unable to weather the storm because of some foolish decisions which had been made in how it managed its finances and lent money. What then is Jesus' definition of a wise man who builds his house on the rock? Well, it's simply this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So how do these words of Jesus apply in relation to our personal finances, our money? I want to give you three biblical principles this morning which can help you to build wisely. And if you build wisely, you will weather the storm. Number one, be content with what you have. Be content with what you have. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews says in chapter 13 in the concluding remarks, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And in Deuteronomy, God says this another way. He says, do not covet. Do not lust after your neighbor's possessions, his house, his car, his land, his wife. Do not set your heart on anything which belongs to someone else. And whereas various commands speak to actions like do not murder, do not kill, do not commit uh, adultery, this command speaks to our attitude and to our heart. Why does the writer to the Hebrews draw this link between being content and the promise of God that he will never leave you nor forsake you? It's a promise which occurs twice. It's spoken to the Israelites in Deuteronomy. But Jesus says something very similar to his disciples just before he leaves the earth. He says in Matthew 28:20. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And the reason is simple, because the material things of this world cannot truly satisfy. Possessions cannot truly satisfy. Power cannot truly satisfy. Sex cannot truly satisfy. And money is a means to the material things of this world. It's a means to satisfy as well our greeds, our bodily desires. But actually, it's only God who created us who can truly satisfy. God's presence in our lives and our relationship with him is the only thing which can truly satisfy us. So we need to build our lives on Jesus because Jesus is the only one who satisfies the famous Christian writer Augustine in the fourth century, he puts it like this, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts will not find rest until we, they find their rest in you. You see, there's a God-shaped hole within your heart and only God can fill that hole. You cannot fill it with material things of this world. They will not satisfy that hole within you. Only God can do that. And the wise builder is the one who is content with what he has and satisfied in Jesus. The foolish builder is the one 
who is trying to gain more in the hope that one day he can be satisfied by the things of this world, if only he or she will have enough. Be content with what you have. Number two, store up treasure in heaven. In Matthew 6, Jesus says this, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Paul tells Timothy that there is a crown of righteousness to be awarded to everyone who believes when Jesus returns. Jesus should be your treasure. He should be the one to whom you're committing your resources, your time, your giftings, your finances. And then there will be an eternal reward for those who are serving Christ. We're told by Jesus not to be like the Pharisees who serve because they seek the praise of men. They're seeking earthly reward. And Jesus says that they've already received their reward in full. Jesus meets with and challenges a rich young ruler. He challenges the ruler to sell all his possessions and give the money to the poor. The ruler looks very keen. Lord, what must I do? I, will, I want to come and follow you. But Jesus sees through his selfish heart, his heart of greed, and he exposes it. And the rich young ruler goes away very sad because he has lots of possessions and he's unable to do what Jesus asked. His focus is on his money and he's not prepared to give it up. In Luke, in Luke 19, however, that we're told about a man called Zacchaeus and he's a tax collector and he encounters Jesus and he is saved. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. So the response of Zacchaeus is in sharp contrast to that of the rich young ruler. Because your attitude towards your money reflects your attitude towards Jesus. And Jesus himself says that we cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve God and money. Someone once said there is no such thing as a Christian Scrooge. The desire to give generously is a sign that we are truly born again. And the man who is truly building on the Lord Jesus will give with a generous heart because Jesus gave everything for us. He laid down his life for us. And as followers of Jesus, we should show the same generosity of spirit and concern for the things of God in everything we do, including in our finances. Jesus tells another parable as well about the rich fool. A man acquires and stores up worldly wealth for the future. And then in the parable, God says to him, You foolish one, tonight your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? And Jesus says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. If you treasure your money, your worldly wealth, above Jesus, you are a foolish builder. You are not building on rock. You are building on the things of this world and you're building on shifting sand. Because the material things of this world will be swept away and we cannot take them with us into eternity.
And Job is right when he says this, naked was I born and naked will I return. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Jesus is saying here that you are to seek the things of God above the things of this world. And when you seek God first, God knows your needs and he will provide for them. Your attitude should be first and foremost one of serving God in whatever he is calling you to do. What does this mean practically? Well, uh, our sister Lorna mentioned the book of Daniel at the beginning of the service. And take the example of Daniel. I mean, there was a decree. Here's a decree from the king. No one should pray. And Daniel could have said to himself, well, I have a high-ranking job. I have a good pay. I better obey what the king says. Otherwise, I might lose my job. I might go to jail. I might even be executed. But of course, Daniel does not. Daniel knows that his duty is to God, and what God says takes priority, it takes precedence over the rules of a man, even a king. So Daniel is obedient to God. He seeks first the kingdom of God, and God provides for him. Daniel is thrown in the lion's den, but the lions do not harm him, and Daniel is vindicated, and everyone knows that God is on Daniel's side. And it's when we honor God, it's when we put him first, that Scripture promises he will provide for our needs. So we should not hoard up treasure here on earth like the rich fool or the rich young ruler. We should store up treasure in heaven, believing that God will provide for our material needs putting him first, seeking first his kingdom, doing what he is calling us to do with our finances. So point number one, be content with what you have. Point number two, seek first his kingdom and store up treasure in heaven. And point number three, be a good steward. Be a good steward. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story about a master who goes away on a journey and he entrusts differing amounts of money to three of his trusted servants. And two of the stewards, two of the servants, invest the money wisely. But the third does not. The third simply buries the money and when the master returns, he commends the two servants who have invested wisely and have multiplied his money, but he condemns the third servant for acting foolishly. And the point of this story is that God expects us to be wise overseers of whatever has been entrusted to us. None of what we think we have is really truly ours. Everything comes from God, everything we have and everything ultimately belongs to God. And God can take it away from us at any time. Part of that good stewardship is being astute in how we invest our finances and look after our financial affairs. And there are many aspects to this. How do you manage your finances? Are you simply spending all your money, living hand to mouth, or are you planning, are you putting something away for a rainy day? Are you choosing to invest your money ethically, not gambling, for instance? Are you wasting your money to satisfy greeds and addictions? Do you avoid penalties by complying with the law, not parking on double yellow lines and getting your tax return in on time rather than getting a fine? How about insurance? If you have expensive items, are you choosing to insure them? This building here is insured. 
a responsible approach to spreading risk is taking out insurance. And it's not incompatible with exercising our faith. After all, we would not get into a car and um, when we're asked to put our seatbelt on, we wouldn't say, no, I'm going to trust God for this journey. I'm not going to wear the seatbelt. I'm just going to put my trust in God. And the correct principle here is that we need to do what we can. We need to do what we can for ourselves, and then we trust God for the rest. So we should not take wild financial risks, hoping that God will somehow bail us out if it all goes wrong. We need to exercise wide, wise stewardship and manage our risks sensibly. In the past, I've heard testimonies from people who have heard really clearly from God that they are to give everything away. Uh, just like the rich ruler was told by Jesus to give everything he has to the poor. People with that kind of testimony. And if God does indeed speak to you clearly in that way, then I suggest you go ahead and do it. But for most people, actually, it's not what God requires. God requires a good and wise stewarding of the resources he has entrusted to us and that money must not be our focus. You should not be a hoarder of wealth. But when times are good, the wise builder will put something away for a rainy day. And there's a biblical principle here. Think about Joseph in the land of Egypt. Seven years of plenty, and he puts away grain ready for the seven years of famine. Wise and good stewardship. The man, the wise builder, is the one who is good and wise in stewarding his own finances. Part of being a good and wise steward of finances is also living free from debt. So why should Christians aim to be debt-free? Well, Proverbs 22, verse 7, it says this, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. In Jesus, God has himself paid your debt. He has paid for your sins on the cross. The Bible tells us clearly the wages of sin is death, but that price has been fully paid. So in Christ, you are now debt-free as far as God is concerned. We were in bondage to Satan, but Christ has set us free then. So then, as a Christian, why should you avoid debt? Well, an essential characteristic of debt is that it places you in bondage to the person or organization you are indebted to. Debt restricts your freedom, it restricts your liberty, and it places on you a legal and a moral obligation to repay whatever debt you have run up. And God's ideal for you as a Christian, as his follower, is that you should be free and clear of obligations so that you can exercise independent stewardship over your resources, over creation, and you can serve God without being indebted to the things of this world, to organizations of this world, to people of this world. Of course, that doesn't mean that all financial debt is wrong in all circumstances. For example, most people could not afford a house without taking out a mortgage. And in London, many people cannot afford a house even with a mortgage. <laughs> That's another issue. But provided payments are, repayments are within your means, then okay, no problem. But of course, you should be aware, you should remember that a mortgage does tie you to a particular property. It may be difficult if you want to relocate to sell your property. It may be uh, difficult to rent it out. So there is some uh, sacrifice, if you like, of uh, liberty, of freedom in taking out that mortgage, even though that may be fine in some circumstances for you to do that. A season ticket loan or buying a car on high purchase may also make very good financial sense. But the really problematic 
type of debt is when you borrow beyond your means, and especially when you borrow to buy things that you don't really need. And we live in a society where it's really easy to get credit. Perhaps not quite as easy as it used to be, uh, but still, interest-free credits, buy now, pay next week, pay in a year, pay in 10 years, all of those kinds of offers are there to entice us. It can be easy to rack up debt, which is difficult then to repay. And you become enslaved to a credit card company or a lender with their high interest rates. And a lot of your repayments then go simply on servicing debt interest payments. So the wise builder is the one who avoids debt and spends within their means as part of exercising wise stewardship of their resources. So three principles for building wisely. Number one, be content with what you have. Do not cover, do not be greedy. Be satisfied instead in God. Don't take your satisfaction from the things of this world. Instead, focus on God as the one who truly satisfies. Number two, store up treasure in heaven. Seek first his kingdom and give generously. Number three, be a good and wise steward. Be wise with what God has entrusted to you and live free from crippling debt. So I said there were three questions, and so far I have asked you two. First of all, are you ready for the storm? Secondly, are you building wisely? So here is my third and final question. Do you have the faith to ride out the storm? In Mark chapter 4, we're told that Jesus calls his disciples to go over to the other side of the lake. Let me uh, read it to you. It's on the slide. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious sprawl came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he, Jesus, got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And Mark says they were terrified. And asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus is there with his disciples. This large physical storm hits the lake. And the boat is tossed from side to side. And the disciples fear they are going to drown. I said earlier, as a Christian, you should expect storms to come along. Things which will test your faith. And how you weather the storm will depend on your foundation. Have you heeded the words of Jesus? Have you been a wise builder in how you structure your finances and how you live your life in your attitude towards your money? Are you content with what you have? Are you content in Christ? If so, you do not derive your pleasure or your security from the material things. And if material things are removed from you, you will weather the storm. If your satisfaction is in Christ, if you lose everything, you will still be satisfied. Paul says in Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Christ is enough. If Christ is enough, you will weather the storm. Are you storing up treasure in heaven? Jesus says himself that if you store up treasure on earth, 
Moths will come, vermin will come, thieves will come and steal. But if your treasure is in heaven, if you are sowing into God's kingdom in pursuit of an eternal reward, your investment is secure. When the storm comes, it cannot destroy what you have already laid up in heaven. Are you seeking first his kingdom, not anxious for the future, not worried for the future, not worried about how you will survive, not worried about the material things of life? If so, if you were to lose your job, you would weather that storm, knowing that God has provided for you in the past, and he will provide for you again. Do you give generously? Perhaps others will remember your generosity when you face times of difficulty. If you give generously, the storm cannot touch your finances because they are laid up in heaven. Thirdly, are you being a good and wise steward of your finances? Have you invested money wisely? Have you spread risk? Have you taken out insurance? Like Joseph, did you put things away during the good years for the times of famine? If so, you will weather the storm because you have made wise choices, because you have been a good and responsible steward of what God has entrusted to you. Do you live debt-free? Do you live within your means? When the storm comes, you will not face the kind of financial difficulties experienced by those who have over-mortgaged, they have over-borrowed. You will be nobody else's slave. The wise steward will weather the storm. But even when we build wisely, there can be things which are unforeseen in our lives. Things which will shake your house or things which will rock your boat. For example, your car breaks down. You need it for work. Suddenly there's a large unexpected bill and you don't know how you're going to pay it. Or your business is under pressure. One of your customers goes bust, goes bankrupt. Suddenly you're owed lots of money and you can't see how it's going to be repaid. And often things can come all at once. They can come together and they can threaten to sink your ship. And then maybe you're like the disciples in Mark 4. Jesus, where are you? Jesus, help. Jesus, we are sinking. And Jesus will reply, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Because your ability to weather the storm comes ultimately from your faith in God. Faith which comes from knowing that you serve a good God who will never leave you nor forsake you and in whom you can put your trust. Faith comes from knowing that God has acted in the past and believing that he will act again to save us. Faith comes when we choose to allow Jesus to take absolute control of our lives and when you surrender your life to him, you will see him working in your life. You will know that he is good, and you will know that you can trust him. And when the storm comes, where is God? Well, he's right there. He's right there in the boat with you. He is not concerned. Jesus is not concerned. There's this huge storm on Lake Galilee, yet Jesus is not concerned. There's a huge storm in your life. Jesus is not concerned and neither should you be. When the storm comes, trees will bend in the wind, and some trees will break. But those trees which do not break actually become stronger as a result of the storm. The foundation is only exposed in the storm. The storm is the testing, but the storm is also what will make you stronger and the storms of life will certainly come. So here are my questions. Are you ready for the storm? Are you building wisely? And do you have the faith to ride out the storm? So let's pray.